the good news. If thy right eye offends thee, lock it out. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's not an okay. 
That's a problem. It would be a pity, this preacher thinks, if all we took away from this morning's reading was a shrug and discouragement. I hope the takeaway this morning is not that in following Jesus we might have to get busy chopping off our body parts, <laughs> ditching our families, quitting our jobs, and moving into monasteries. No, we must somehow take this thing that Jesus is saying into account. His words make me fearful and frightened, but I must deal with them. Why? Because his words have to do with our very discipleship, my very salvation, with my spiritual health, which is not always in tip-top condition, <coughs> let alone. No, we have to take his medicine but why did Jesus put his point in this horrifying image? I guess because the point, even though it's brief, must be of horrifying importance. It's don't let anything stop you from taking your own individual part in Jesus' life. Don't let anything stop you from accepting your part in the whole reign of God. When he tells you your possessions are getting in your way, making it hard to hear him. Don't be like that attractive, eager young man he once met who was invited along, but who went away very sad as he was loaded down with possessions. Rabbi Jesus is using a rabbinic way to teach. He is out preaching, hammering his point vividly, with vividness to this large crowd of people, some of whom in the back probably can't hear him so well. But man, that they got into arguments about each other's possessions. I imagine them walking home after this sermon, arguing. Ho, oh, oh, ho, how about that mighty fine new well you just dug that we keep hearing about, brother? Sister, how about that new box cart you're still afraid even to bring out of the barn? You're afraid someone will scratch it. I know the supper table. Just imagine, holy God, you should have heard the way he put it in them. Holy God, well, did you ever? Well, no, I <laughs> Seriously, we want to follow Jesus. If we are doing something that's getting in our own way, that thing that's doing that needs to be pulled up and pulled out and thought about. Its relative value needs to be thought about. Compare it to the incomparable value of gaining the kingdom of God and his Christ. Yes, gaining it not even someday in some other world, but gaining it even for this life. Knowing yourself to be safely already feeding on Christ, already part of that kingdom that is coming, roaring at us. Knowing all the material things you worry about are being held in the everlasting arms. All you have loved and all you have lost, actually, are safe in the life that never ends. Safe where all things lost. Safe even when things are tumbling down around your ears. And if the things of this mortal life pass away, maybe quickly and unexpectedly, or maybe after a lengthy struggle that is lost, well, on that day, most blessed will be the one who believed, meaning who trusted, that there would be a fulfillment of these promises spoken by God. Whoever lives in Christ's risen life shall not die forever. We say it at every funeral. No torment will ever touch them. Here is Rupert Brooke, the war poet, in a, paradoxical, in a paradoxical set of lines. He wrote, Safe shall be my going secretly shielded from all death's desire. Safe where all safety's lost, safe where men fall. And if these poor limbs die, safest of all. Try this, turn it a bit around. Instead of saying, oh no, what do I have to give up? Or what must I give up? Ask instead, what am I holding on to? What appetite is ruling me? What am I clutching so tightly that I cannot open my hand to clasp my Savior's hand when he stretches it right out to me? Do you know, as Dorothy Sayers, 
my mother knew her as a writer of murder mysteries. She was also one of the great theologians of the 20th century. She wrote this, now by appetites, I do not mean normal enjoyments and normal pleasures, but I mean those things, and they're different for each one of us, those things which rule us and not we them. Almost anything that we cannot drop instantly when the bugle of our spirit blows. Nothing has permanence in and of itself. Each of these things is going to be gathered up, restored, transformed, untwisted wherever it is out of twist, untwisted and restored wherever there's pain. It's slated for correction. It will be restored more completely than any restorer on earth can restore anything. These are the visions cast by our creator God, our creating God, Bishop Mary says. The one who takes the time to trace out the promises and who trusts these promises will not die forever. We need not fear losing any of them. Let's commend our treasure then. Let's commend our treasure to the only safe place. Not in the places where water and mud get in and worm and moth destroy. And let it free us up. Let letting them go. Let that free us up for friendship and service, as Jesus was free for friendship and service. When the perfect comes, whatever is imperfect, whatever is painful, whatever is incomplete, is going to pass away, to be remembered no more in the glow of that new life that's staring me right in the face, that never ends that new life. It's a mystery now. It's a time and a, and a state that we have never known. And still it's a time that we desperately seek and want. Thy will be done on earth, just as easily as it's done in heaven, just as thoroughly as it's done in heaven, as cheerfully as it's done in heaven. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be found, Jesus said. Every day, that's true. Every day, right up to the coming of that last great day. And at that hour, may God's whole will be done for you and to all 